iceberg videos have become extremely popular on YouTube lately, so I'm going to try and jump on the bandwagon. You should all know how this works, but if you've been living under a rock for the past several months, here's a quick explanation. Icebergs are a way of presenting information on a particular topic, starting with more well-known information near the top and working down to more obscure information near the bottom. This is the Magic the Gathering Rules Iceberg. Magic is a very complex game. The complete comprehensive rulebook is 250 pages long, and there are over 20,000 unique cards. So of course there are all sorts of weird edge cases and strange card interactions. This iceberg explores some of these. I can't take credit for the original iceberg. It was posted to Reddit by a user named Fabulous Mare. I'll leave a link to the original post in the description below. I've been playing Magic on and off since 2004, and I think I have a pretty good and in-depth understanding of the rules. I did a fair bit of research for this video just to make sure I got everything as correct as possible. If I've made any mistakes in this video, then feel free to point them out in the comments below. There are a few obsolete rulings on this iceberg. These are written in orange text. I'll also point them out in my explanation for the benefit of anyone who prefers to just listen to these sorts of videos rather than watching them. With all that out the way, let's get on to the actual iceberg. There are seven card types. Artifact, Creature, Enchantment, Planeswalker, Instant, Sorcery, and Lan. These are the seven card types that every Magic player should know. Untap, Upkeep, Draw. These are the three steps of the beginning phase in order. It's fairly common for beginners or casual players to do these out of order, such as drawing a card before untapping, but this is technically the correct order. Colourless is not a colour. Pretty self-explanatory, colourless is not a colour. If you need to choose a colour, you can't choose colourless. For example, Birds of Paradise cannot tap for colourless mana. London Mulligan. This is the current mulligan rule. At the start of the game, you can shuffle your hand back into your library and draw the same number of cards as many times as you like. Once you decide to keep a hand, you must place one card from your hand on the bottom of your library for each time that you took a mulligan. Artwork has no gameplay impact. A card's artwork does not influence its abilities in any way. A classic example of this would be if a creature is shown flying in the artwork but doesn't have the flying ability in its text box, it is not a flying creature. These types of oversights were fairly common on older cards as artists were given only vague descriptions of what to draw. However, these days, artists are given very detailed descriptions of what to draw, so these kind of mistakes are very rare. You can cast instants whenever you want. This is how instants are generally explained to newer players. It's not technically correct, as we'll see a bit later on, but for beginners it's a close enough explanation. You don't tap to block. Creatures have to tap to attack, so a lot of newer players assume that creatures have to tap to block as well, but they don't. A creature that is tapped cannot block, but blocking does not cause a creature to become tapped. This is important in a few situations, like if a creature has an activated ability that requires tapping, it can use that ability after it blocks. Mana weaving is illegal. Now, mana weaving is a slang term referring to evenly distributing lands within your deck before shuffling. If you shuffle your deck sufficiently after mana weaving, then it shouldn't make any difference, so mana weaving is simply pointless. However, if you don't shuffle your deck sufficiently afterwards, then it is altering the distribution of your deck and is therefore considered cheating. Llanowar Elves don't fetch forests. Llanowar Elves has an ability that says tap, add, and then the symbol that appears on all of the forests. So naturally new players assume that it searches forests from your library, but it doesn't. It simply adds mana to your mana pool the same way a land adds mana to your mana pool. There are eight card types. In addition to the seven card types mentioned in the first layer, 
there is also tribal. Tribal never stands on its own, it's always used in combination with another card type. It exists so that non-creature cards can have creature types for tribal synergies. Many players think that tribal is a super type, like legendary or snow, but according to the rules it must be a type in order to be able to grant subtypes to its cards. The stack. This is what allows players to respond to their opponent's spells and abilities by playing their own spells and abilities. It's like a stack in programming in that it follows a last in first out rule. In other words, the spell that was played most recently resolves first. So here's a classic example. A player casts lightning bolt targeting their opponent's grizzly bears. The opponent responds by casting giant growth on the grizzly bears. Giant Growth is the last spell played, so it resolves first, making the Grizzly Bears a 5-5. Then the Lightning Bolt resolves, and it deals 3 damage to the Grizzly Bears, which is no longer enough to kill it. Every non-land is a spell. In everyday English, spell is more or less a synonym for sorcery. It's not really intuitive for players to think of creatures as a spell, but in magic, they are. This means cards like Counterspell can stop creatures or artifacts just as they can stop instants and sorceries. Legend Rule Legendary permanents represent unique characters or objects within the lore. For this reason, you can't have more than one of any legendary permanent in play at a time. There have been a few versions of the Legend Rule over the years, but the current rule is that each player may have up to one copy of any given legendary permanent. If any player has multiple legendary permanents with the same name, they choose one to remain in play and the rest go to the graveyard. Lands are colourless. The colour of a card is determined by the colours of mana in its mana cost. Since lands don't have a mana cost, they are colourless. So planes are not white cards. A blue elemental blast cannot destroy a mountain. Can't beats can. An ability that prevents an action will always take precedence over an ability that allows an action. Oracle text overrides printed card text. From time to time, various cards' wordings need to be updated. Occasionally this occurs because there is a mistake on the printed card, but more often it's just to ensure that all cards have a consistent wording so that consistent rulings can be made about interactions. All cards are played according to their oracle text, not according to the text written on the actual card. Gatherer Joke Ruling Gatherer is the official database of cards hosted on Wizards of the Coast's website. It also includes official rulings for many cards, and some of these rulings include jokes. For example, in the official rulings for Void Winnower, it points out that your opponent can't even. Or in the rulings for Archdemon of Paliano, it notes that if you draft multiple Archdemons, you should consider carefully why the Archdemon seems to favour you. Level Up starts at level 0. Level Up was an ability from Zendikar. Creatures with Level Up could place level counters on themselves, and they would then gain more abilities and better stats as they reached certain levels. The card's level is determined by the number of level counters on it, and they start with no level counters, so they start at level 0, not level 1. Death Touch and Trample. If a creature with Trample assigns lethal damage to all the creatures blocking it, the remainder of the damage can be dealt to the defending player. With Death Touch, only one damage needs to be assigned to be lethal. So if a creature has both Death Touch and Trample, it only needs to deal one damage to each blocker, and the rest of the damage can be dealt to the defending player. Creatures stay blocked even if the blocker is removed. While it may be counterintuitive, once a creature has become blocked, it remains blocked for the rest of combat regardless of what happens to the blocking creature. If a blocking creature is removed before combat damage, the blocked creature will still not deal damage to the defending player unless it has trample. Converted mana cost of X spells. While an X spell is on the stack, the chosen value of X applies, otherwise X is zero. So for example, if you cast Fireball with x equals 5, its converted mana cost would be 6. But if Fireball is in your hand, graveyard, or library, it has a converted mana cost of 1. Set symbols have no gameplay impact. 
Exactly what it says. Apart from a few silver bordered cards, set symbols have no impact on gameplay at all. Set symbols have no gameplay impact anymore. There are a few cards, colloquially known as set hoses, that serve as counterplay to cards from specific sets. Previously, set symbol mattered for these cards to determine which other cards they affect. They've now received errata to only care about cards that were originally printed in these specific sets. Under the current ruling, a city in a bottle will destroy an Aladdin's ring from 9th edition just as well as it will destroy an Aladdin's ring from the Arabian Nights. There are 13 card types. In addition to the eight card types that we saw in the first two layers, there are also Conspiracies, Phenomenon, Plain, Scheme, and Vanguard. Each of these card types are only used in certain special game modes. Conspiracies are used in the Conspiracy format. Phenomena and Planes are used in the Plane Chase format. Schemes are used in the Arch Enemy format. And Vanguards are used in the Vanguard format. Regeneration. Regeneration is a relatively complex ability. The basic idea is that it stops a permanent from dying. This is already potentially confusing because to many the name suggests that it brings creatures back from the dead, which it doesn't, it merely stops them from dying. Regenerating a permanent creates a replacement effect where the next time that permanent would be destroyed this turn, instead it isn't. Instead, it's tapped. If it's a creature, all damage is healed from it at that point, and if it's in combat, it is removed from combat. Shortcuts. You can skip over certain events as long as all players agree to it. Shortcuts are necessary to keep the game actually playable. So for example, when you pass the turn to your opponent, technically you and your opponent should each be passing priority backwards and forwards for each remaining phase in the turn but nobody actually plays like that because it makes the game horribly boring. Fizzling. Fizzling is not an official term anymore, but it's still very commonly used. If a spell requires targets, and none of the targets are legal as the spell would resolve, the spell does not resolve. If it has any other effects that do not target, they will not resolve. This rule is not particularly intuitive, and according to Mark Rosewater, there have been some discussions about changing the rule, but for now it remains. Generic versus colorless mana. Generic mana is mana that appears in a mana cost that can be paid with any type of mana. Colorless mana is mana that has no color. For much of the game's history, colorless mana used the same symbol as generic mana, which could potentially result in confusion. However, colorless mana now has its own specific symbol. Protection. This is another relatively confusing ability. The confusion mainly comes from what it doesn't do. It doesn't actually stop absolutely all effects from that particular color. The mnemonic for what it stops is debt. Something with protection cannot be damaged, cannot be enchanted or equipped, cannot be blocked, and cannot be targeted by something with the specified properties. However, if a spell does not do at least one of those things, then protection will not stop it. For example, you cannot cast Terror targeting a white knight because Terror targets, and protection prevents targeting. If you play Damnation, it will destroy a white knight because Damnation does not damage or target. Only one alternate cost can be paid. If several effects grant an alternate cost for casting a spell, only one of them may be paid. One example of where this is relevant is Flashback. Flashback is itself an alternate cost, so you cannot pay any alternate costs to cast the spell from the graveyard. Snow isn't a type of mana. Snow costs can be paid with any mana from a snow source, but snow is not itself a type of mana. So if you copy mana from a snow source, for example with doubling cube, the copied mana cannot be used to pay snow costs. Reflexive triggers. Reflexive triggers are essentially triggered abilities within triggered abilities. An example of this would be Heart Piercer Manticore. We can compare the Heart Piercer Manticore with Koldotha Flame Fiend, which has a fairly similar effect but is not a reflexive trigger. With the Flame Fiend, 
You choose the targets as soon as the ability goes on the stack and your opponent has a chance to respond. When the triggered ability resolves, you choose whether to sacrifice an artifact and if you do, the damage is dealt to the target immediately. For example, if your opponent gives the targeted creature protection from red, you can choose not to sacrifice the artifact. With the Manticore on the other hand, first the ability goes on the stack with no chosen target and your opponent has a chance to respond. Then you choose whether to sacrifice a creature, and if you do, you choose the target for the reflexive trigger and your opponent has another chance to respond before the damage is dealt. So your opponent can wait until after you've decided to sacrifice your creature before they give their creature protection from red. Converted mana cost of split cards. While on the stack, the converted mana cost of a split card is equal to the converted mana cost of the half being cast. While not on the stack, the converted mana cost is equal to the combined converted mana costs of both halves. Planeswalker Uniqueness Rule, Obsolete Ruling The Planeswalker Uniqueness Rule was similar to the Legend Rule, but changed to fix a big flavour fail. Under the Legend Rule, you can have multiple cards representing the same character, as long as they aren't exactly the same version. For example, you can have Thalia Guardian of Thraben and Thalia Heretic Cathar on the field at the same time, even though they both represent the same character. The Planeswalker Uniqueness Rule attempted to fix this by giving all Planeswalkers a Planeswalker type which said which character they represent, and you could not have two versions of the same character in play at the same time. Ultimately, it was decided that this rule added too much complexity for little real gain, and so now all Planeswalkers are simply legendary and follow the normal legendary rules. Trample and Death Touch versus Protection as we saw in the previous layer, a creature with Death Touch and Trample only needs to assign one damage to each blocker, and the rest can be assigned to the defending player. If one of the blocking creatures has a protection ability, the damage that is assigned to it will be prevented, however the remaining damage still tramples over to the defending player. Mana Burn, Obsolete Rule When unused mana emptied from a player's mana pool at the end of a phase, that player would lose life equal to the amount of mana lost in that way. This was meant to make abilities that generate lots of mana have sort of risk-reward payoff, but mana burn rarely actually mattered, and so it was eventually removed. Priority. Priority determines when players can play spells and abilities. Only the player with priority may can play a spell or ability. At the start of each step of each phase, the active player, that is the player whose turn it currently is, has priority. They can either play a spell or ability or pass priority to the next player. When all players pass priority in a row, the spell or ability that's on top of the stack resolves, and then the active player gains priority again. If all players pass priority with no spells or abilities on the stack, then the game moves to the next step or phase with the active player then gaining priority again. Loops force draws. If an infinite loop occurs that contains optional actions, the player who controls the optional actions will determine how many times the loop is repeated and must then move on. If a loop occurs containing only non-optional actions, then it continues infinitely and the game is a draw. Combat damage uses the stack. Obsolete rule. This was a fix for the damage prevention window, which we'll see much lower down in the iceberg. During combat, players would assign combat damage, which would be locked in, and could then play spells or abilities before the damage was actually dealt. It was intended to allow a chance to play damage prevention abilities in response to the damage, but very often it was used to play other abilities. In particular, it made any ability that requires sacrificing a creature much stronger, for example, Mog Fanatic could kill a creature with two toughness by assigning one damage on the stack and then sacrificing itself for its ability to deal another damage. Failing to find. If a spell or ability requires you to find a card with certain characteristics from a hidden zone, for example your library, you do not have to find a card if you don't want to. 
you don't have to prove that you don't have any appropriate cards to find. For example, with Mystical Tutor, you can choose not to find out anything, even if you still have instants or sorceries in your library. If a spell or ability requires you to find any card without defining characteristics for that card to have, then you cannot fail to find. For example, if you cast Demonic Tutor and have at least one card left in your library, you have to choose a card from your library. Oblivion Ring Tricks When Oblivion Ring enters play, its ability goes on the stack. If you respond to the ability by bouncing or flickering the Oblivion Ring before its Enter the Battlefield ability resolves, its Leaves the Battlefield ability will go on the stack on top of the Enters the Battlefield ability. The Leaves the Battlefield ability will resolve first, but will not do anything because the Oblivion Ring has not exiled anything yet. Then the Enters the Battlefield ability will resolve, exiling the target permanently. This is a fairly unintuitive ruling, so newer cards with similar effects are templated differently, meaning that they cannot permanently exile anything. Plus one, plus one counters and neg one, neg one counters cancel each other out. If a creature has both plus one, plus one counters and neg one, neg one counters on it at the same time, then remove an equal amount of both such that only one type of counter remains on it. Rule 100.6b. This rule says players can use the magic store and event locator at wizards.com slash locator to find tournaments in their area. This is an official part of the comprehensive rule, so this should mean that you can do this during a game. Phasing. This is an ability from older sets. At the beginning of the untap step, before untapping, all permanents with phasing phase out, and simultaneously all phased out permanents phase in. While phased out, they're treated as if they don't exist, but they keep all counters, auras, equipment, and so on on them while phased out. Phasing in and out does not trigger enter the battlefield or leave the battlefield abilities. Tokens aren't cards. This is exactly what it says. It's mainly just an interesting bit of trivia, but I'm sure there's some obscure rules interaction somewhere where this matters, but I couldn't actually find one. Mana abilities. A mana ability is either A an activated ability that does not require a target and which could add mana to the mana pool, or b, a triggered ability that does not require a target, which could add mana to a mana pool and triggers due to an activated mana ability. Mana abilities are special because unlike other abilities, they cannot be responded to and do not use the stack. They're also special in that they can be activated while casting a spell, or activating an ability that requires a mana cost. Token Ownership Tokens are owned by the player who created them. Previously, the ruling was tokens are owned by the player who controlled the ability that created them. There are a few tricks that could be used under the old rule. For example, you could play Hunted Horror and follow it up with Brand, and you would gain control of the centaur tokens that your opponent got. This no longer works under the current rule, because the tokens are owned by the player who created them. Mirko Vosk doesn't mill. Although it puts cards from the top of a player's library into their graveyard, it doesn't use the keyword mill, so it doesn't officially count as milling. As far as I can tell, there are no abilities that specifically trigger when cards are milled, so this doesn't matter, but if they ever make a card in the future that specifically triggers on milling, Mirko Vosk won't work. Transforming double-faced cards and modal double-faced cards. These are two different types of double-faced cards. They work slightly differently. Transforming double-faced cards only have a mana cost on their front side, so only the front side can be cast. The card will then have some kind of ability that allows it to transform to the back side. Modal double face cards have mana costs on both sides, so either side can be played. Face down cards are turned face up at the end of the game. Morph and other similar effects can place cards face down. At the end of the game, 
all cards are revealed to make sure that they could actually be played with Morph. Converted mana cost of double-faced cards. For transforming double-faced cards, the converted mana cost is equal to the converted mana cost of the front side, even while its back side is active. For modal double-faced cards, each side has its own converted mana cost. While the card is on the stack or in play, its converted mana cost is equal to the side that is played. While it is in any other zone, the converted mana cost is equal to the converted mana cost of the front side of the card. Replacement effects. Replacement effects are effects that modify an event. Replacement effects don't use the stack and can't be responded to, and each event can only be modified by a replacement effect once. This is to prevent infinite loops. Maro's unstable ruling. Maro is the nickname given to Mark Rosewater, the head designer for Magic the Gathering. He is also the rules manager for the unsets, which are silver-boarded card sets, which are not tournament legal. Many of the cards in unsets do things that cannot be done within the normal rules of Magic the Gathering. They also generally have a much more humorous flavour than cards in regular sets. To go along with this more humorous flavour, the rulings articles, written by Mark Rosewater, are written in a much more humorous manner than typical rules articles. Instants and sorceries can never be on the battlefield. The rules specifically state if an instant or sorcery card would ever be put onto the battlefield, it remains in its current zone instead. Rule 104.3f is impossible. Rule 104.3f states, if a player would both win and lose the game simultaneously, that player loses the game. There has been a bit of debate about this, but as far as I can tell, there is no way for a player to win and lose simultaneously. They will always either win or lose slightly before the other. This rule is just here for the sake of completeness, in case some sort of weird edge case ever does arise. Urza's is a land type. There are a set of three cards, Urza's Tower, Urza's Power Plant, and Urza's Mine, which are collectively nicknamed Urzatron or just Tron. Each of these is a land that can tap for one colourless mana. However, if all three are on the field, then Urza's Tower can tap for three colourless mana, and Urza's Mine and Urza's Power Plant can each tap for two colourless mana. To make the templating a bit easier, they made Urza's, and then all of the types, land subtypes, so the cards can just say Urza's Mine, Urza's Power Plant, instead of saying a card named Urza's Mine, a card named Urza's Power Plant. Trample, Death Touch, and Double Strike versus Protection. This is basically what we saw in the previous layer of the iceberg. The creature with Trample and Death Touch must assign one damage to each creature blocking it. Any creatures that have Protection will prevent that damage, but the remainder of the damage still tramples over. The difference is that this will happen twice because of Double Strike once during the first strike damage step, and then a second time during the regular damage step. That's it for part one of the iceberg. Part two won't be out for a couple of weeks, as I'll be spending the next few weeks in New Zealand visiting my sister. I had hoped to get the entire iceberg done before leaving, but that's not going to happen. I'll try to get part two uploaded shortly after I get back, and then part three a week or two after that. Be sure to come back and check those out as parts 2 and 3 are where we're going to get into the really interesting rulings. If you're watching this video more than a couple of weeks after it came out, then parts 2 and 3 are probably already up. Go check them out now. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.